There we go. We're live. Uh, hello, everybody at the Elephant and Castle community. Uh, I am Nick from Retribe, and joining me today is George Biddle. He's the founder and CEO of the Grad Sock. The, the, the Grad Sock. We were talking about the name just before, so I got my, <laughs> my tongue tied. Um, and uh, which is an awesome, cool company um, that I'm really happy to have George on and explain um, about his journey and how he started the Grad Sock and exactly what it, what it does because it's it is pretty cool. Um, but first of all, George, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm good. Feeling pretty pretty relaxed after a nice nice bank holiday weekend. Um, as I'm sure many will also. Some probably a bit hungover. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, whatever you've done this weekend, I hope it's been a good one. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, a great sentiment. I'm actually, as we've talked about, I'm over in Portugal um, right now, and I I did my first day um out in the sun in portugal like everybody does and mm. i just got absolutely fried so i've been like kind of convalescing in the flat trying to cool off because yeah i got i got the big lobster tan on the first day so i'm regretting that it's it's first day first day burn second day tan right that's i thought that was the general general it's, wisdom it's it yeah you know the beauty is this time of the year it's not very busy and the beach is quite quiet and the water is very very like very chilly so uh, i got a lot of relief to throw myself in the water it was good nice nice i'm yeah. not jealous at all that you're in portugal um, yeah would you uh, yeah you know you should be <laughs> but that's the beauty when, when of you've got beautiful gray skies over birmingham you know uh who needs, hey, who needs sun and sea and beaches? <laughs> the sun is coming the UK's way next week. I hope so, so. Um, I hope so. yeah, send us yeah. Some. it will be. George, um, let's get into let's get into things because I know we're pretty tight for time because you're a busy man. So, could you explain uh, to everybody, you know, who you are and uh, kind of how? Well, yeah, explain to everybody who you are, and then we'll get into what the grad stock is. Yeah, sure. Um, gosh, where do I start? Uh, <laughs> I'm George. I founded the Grad Sock while I was still at uni. Um, I essentially had a bit of a toss up between uh, what I thought was going to be my kind of long term career, uh, going down the, the route of finance, uh, investment banking in particular. I was going to be one of those guys. Um, and yeah, I went and worked in Munich for 13 months at a big investment bank, um, had, you know, a very in depth experience um the 12 13 hours a day were pretty testament to, to that and uh, essentially i just i got back from that did my final year oh. uni and just thought if i'm going to work that that many hours i'm going to do it for myself um uh, and it was a great experience because it i obviously learned a lot but it also taught me what I didn't want to do and what I wasn't passionate about so i feel like a lot is a conversation we have a lot with students is you know, oh, I don't want to waste my time doing something, you know, that I don't care about. Actually, you like don't look at it like that. It's it was a really valuable lesson to me that I needed to do something very different <laughs> because it just didn't it didn't interest me as much as I thought it would be. I don't look at that as a wasted time at all. I look at it as a great lesson that I've learned. Um, so so, yeah, so I came back to uni. Um, and I just looked around me and saw pretty much everyone in the exact same boat. And that was not being able to get experience because they had little or no prior experience. You know, I can rant for days about universities and about companies who put up entry level job positions that require five plus years experience. Go figure that one. Um, and it, it all results back to, you know, this huge amount of stress and anxiety for students in that position. You know, they're taking their final year exams and they have this added stress of, I can't get any experience. So that's where I started. Um, and it was, a, I knew it was an area that I was interested in. I was going through it myself. So I was well informed. Um, and ultimately I kind of arrived at the fact that in order to solve this problem, in order to create a business that is mission led in you know, creating new opportunity for the people who really need it, um, I actually needed to first solve the company's problems. Um, so it was like an interesting kind of bit of a journey initially um, that we've been through many iterations, many pivots to get to where we are. But 
we uh, you know we we now do that pretty successfully and we we solve the company's problems of you know how how do you sort of incentivize them to take more interns well you make them cheaper you make them better run you take away the time management the the training requirements you guarantee an output and a, a good quality of output um, and you do that by taking that all away and saying don't worry about it we'll take care of that for you you just worry about what the interns are creating for you uh, are doing for you um, uh, and how much you involve them in your company and your business so yeah um, that's kind of where where I started where I'm at now um, yeah yeah I, I love your entrepreneurial spirit and I know we've talked before too and I love your you know I love your skills as an organizer and someone who, you know, who found something that they're passionate about and is building it. You know, I spent, spent a bit of time just kind of navigating through your website today. And, and even that is just really well done, you know? So I just, from, from the small amount of time that I've met you, um, you know, I've got an idea of who, like of, of the way you like to work, you know, and you, you did some stuff that we'll unpack. I, I know you're mission led, which is really kind of important too. And we can get into that, but I'm really interested to know, like uh, my first experience with internship was probably, geez, like 28 years ago, I think now, maybe 22 years ago, I started working at Sky Sports and I kind of bypassed the intern thing. And I, I was very lucky. I went straight into, you know, TV presenting, but I had friends that I'd gone to university with and they were like early twenties, graduated with BAs and um, they went into, they went to MTV. And, uh, you know, they just got this free, free internship. So MTV was just, I shouldn't really say the name MTV, but this, 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 I've done it, but this, this company. I was going to say you're a bit late right now. Yeah, a bit late, yeah, yeah, out there live. But they were pulling in interns and they were, I think that maybe you, you, like, it was just a free internship. You came and you were a gopher. You just ran and fetched things and, and very quickly, still without pay they were doing quite responsible jobs. They actually were giving them cameras and go, telling them to go out and film stuff. And by that time, maybe they were getting their expenses paid. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was nearly 30 years ago. And, and I think that, so for me, an old guy, when I hear the word intern, I, I just, I see somebody, I see companies maybe taking advantage of, of students who need to get the experience but really what they're going to do is they're going to come in and just do a bunch of work, not learn anything, probably pay out of their own pocket, you mm -hmm. know, to get some something saying that you've done an internship, you know, at this organization. And, and I'm sure you've noted that different industries have different kind of requirements for interns. And we could probably get into that, too. So how has how is like a guy like me who's seen heard the word internship for nearly 30 years? How has it evolved in, in your time that, that you've you've been around it? Yeah, it's it's very relevant and and very topical. Um, uh, so um, yeah, a, a, a good pick out there from this. So I think that in itself is is one of the issues because the so like so your generation even ten years ago um, companies were still doing this, and I think only fairly recently and especially sort of from the pandemic you know um moving forward it's kind of catalyzed a lot of things um and so the 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 stigma around unpaid internships has has really come to light and so part of that issue is re-educating a whole group of different generations where that was fine because i i refuse to judge like history by modern standards i just i I just don't want to do it. I disagree with it. Um, and so instead of calling out all these companies for doing it wrong, we should help be helping them do it right and update their policies and update the way that they run things. Um, and that is a big part of what we do. You know, it's it's fine to want to have an intern just to give you an extra pair of hands, just to do some extra work for you. That's totally fine. You don't have no no one expects every company to have that kind of nurturing and mentoring nature um, for them to want to invest their time into in, into doing all of these. That's OK. That's fine. But let's call it what it is. And if you want to do that, great. At least pay them and at least th come through a company like us so that 
they can still receive that training. They can still receive that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, uh, but we also work with a lot of companies who are actually, you know, they're going all out. They're, they're really updating themselves and they're going, you know what, we're building this into our culture. We are a company that wants to invest our time and energy into nurturing young talent, into nurturing students and, and the people who need it. Um, which is awesome and that's great and I love working with those companies it's brilliant I had a call this morning in fact with um, uh, a, uh, a company who were like a network of, of, uh, of companies and they, they do a lot for that network they're a membership network and they had this awesome attitude to you know we we already try and bring on a lot of interns but we want to do more um, and we you know see us as a way of, of helping them do that and it's and it's great but um, yeah, I think I think it's really come into light in the last probably two years, um, and um, and yeah, it's nice that we're kind of being mission led. We're at the forefront of that. You know, um, students get get paid you know more than minimum wage under us. They get tons of training and support. You know, that's what we're about. So um, I think yeah, in answer to the question, it's it's less about um calling well yeah less about calling companies out actually more just re-educating them um because it was a different time different generations doing different things for different reasons um uh, so so yeah yeah i love it i think what it is is about changing changing the perception of what that word internship means and and as you're just speaking and, and what i it's like almost it is a entry-level job position you know it's something that it, like you know, people have, and it's called entry level job positions or juniors, you know, and, and the internship now is starting to fit into that kind of the clog of the organization's um, hiring systems. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that. And it's something that I'm going to do is really challenge myself around that word internship, because again, you know, my experiences have been, you know, somebody comes on board with you for a couple of months, you want to be attentive, you want to help them, but you know, and again, it depends what kind of industry you're in, but I was in, in like video and film production and digital advertising. And it was really kind of, it almost, it was, it was time consuming, you know, to make sure that this person could learn something, but also like you have to really focus on the job that you're doing and you don't want to take away from that client. And it, and I found it all, it was a bit of a struggle because it's hard to manage, you know, especially if you're a small team, it, it hmm. really is, which is, you know, it, it's just why I say like, that's fine. Um, mm. you know, if if you do just need an extra pair of hands and you don't have the time to put into them, that's totally fine. Um, just going on our own on our own experience, um, internships for us have been uh, the best way of hiring. Um, I think we kind of live in a culture today where everyone wants something like that, and everyone's like, "Oh, technology can give you that," and I just don't think recruitment can ever be a technology driven thing you may be able to replace the processes with tech you may be able to replace and make that, those more efficient more optimized you may be able to scale it better but ultimately you're dealing with a person um, and that person you will not understand how they work until you actually work with them and so internships are a fantastic way of a, figure out whether you want to hire, whether you need to hire, um, and B, actually making an informed and good decision as whether well. so this is this is a person that I want in my business. Um, so that's that's my opinion on on hiring. Um, loads of companies actually use our internships as a way of try before you buy as well. But um, but yeah, it's it's especially good for the smaller companies, the smaller teams. As like you say, you know, it's it's difficult you're essentially taking on another person um for a period of time you know it's it's tricky to, to to balance as you say your work for the client against how much time you're investing in this in this individual so um what so when you you go to your site you've got i'm a student or i'm an employer let's go down the i'm an, i'm a student route because i know that you have like um certified professional development courses so uh, you're, I imagine you're you're do you're pre-investing in the student before they go into the internship, right? So how do you do that? What courses are available? 
you know, what happens to that to that uh, candidate before they actually get into a work environment? Yeah, um, so we run a monthly membership on our B2C side. Um, and in that membership, you get unlimited coaching sessions, you get access to our courses, you get help with your CV, your cover letter, preparing for an interview, um, applying for jobs. Like we're there to support, train and help students before they even reach that point. Mm -hmm. Because the fact of the matter is, and this may be unfair to some smaller universities, but generally across the board, unis are pretty bad at this. Um, they're through whether that's the fault of their own or whether it's it's just because they're traditionally research bodies as opposed to getting people job bodies. Um, you know, they're they're just slower at moving with industry benchmarks. Um, and so students will come out of a careers department at uni like further off than when they started um, in terms of what to expect in, in terms of what their cv should look like how to prepare for an interview they're just not it, it's always going to be an uphill struggle for unis to stay ahead of the game in terms of what industry expects and what people want to see in in their interviews and in their in their new employees so that's something that we really just decided to take upon ourselves and it, it fits very nicely because as you say it helps us then create a, a you know a constant kind of um feed of of students who are well prepared who understand the expectations um understand much better and are much more confident about what they're going to be doing how to approach that and all the rest of it so it works very nicely do you deal with like real world issues you know like I, I i know somebody who you know they work a lot with students who are getting prepared to get into um education and they see a real struggle in the the younger the students who are you know they're like i think maybe late teens early 20s struggling with just real world problems like getting around transportation systems and you know, figuring out routes to work, you know, they're kind of like, there's, there's these kind of, there's, yeah, there's a, there, there's a, a struggle with real world problems, we'll put it. How do you deal with that? Like, it's great to be able to teach somebody CVs and, and cover letters and all the stuff that you need to be presented face to face or, or, or with your, your potential employer. But what about the, like I say, the real, real world issues, but setting up bank accounts, yeah, you know, travel yeah, yeah, problems, yeah, rent, 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 budgeting, you know, just kind of getting kids, kids, young adults ready for life. It's, uh, for me, it's two things. So the first is just a generation that's grown up having things done like that, like they expect that the, the attention span of Gen Z and below is, is incredibly short. Um, and that is not a good thing at all because they've just grown up using tech they've grown up clicking a button and something happens you know you click a button and you've got a product on your doorstep next next day you click a button and you know whatever it is um and because the, the second part of that is because there's this been this massive boom in in tech and tech jobs we have overcompensated by telling younger generations you need to be skilled in technology you need to learn this code you need to go down you know x route or, or, or whatever you need to you need to do this this and that because of this technology you know um skill shortage and we've overcompensated and so now everyone knows how to you know work a laptop or, or use a phone to to manage a workflow or you know build an app or, or build a website or whatever but as you say they don't know how to open a bank account they don't know how to do practical real world things um for us you get it's a very steep learning curve um anyway when you start a job so we we call this i, I would actually loop this under the same bracket as like work readiness it's things like uh, managing multiple diaries it's things like knowing to follow up after an email it's things like um you know organizing your day in advance i would loop those skills under the same bracket as real world practical skills because they they enable you to do things well um, and interact with people well and i think how do we solve 
I, it, it has to come back to education. It has to. I, I hate putting too much reliance on education, which is why, you know, we've taken the careers piece away from unis. Like we don't even bother working with unis on that because um, we're like, we'll just do it better. It'll always be more up to date. We will just do careers better than unis. Um, but when it comes to things like managing budgets, you know, managing your personal finances, things like that, that is the kind of stuff that I think should be taught in schools. Um, yeah, OK, alongside a course in Python, who cares? But it has to be a balance. At the minute, it's so, so off kilter. It's so off balance. It's that, you know, you learn tech, you're going to earn 80 grand a year and you're going to be great and, you know, life's going to be good. Is it, though? You know, are you, or are you just going to spend your life in front of a laptop and have no social skills, not be able to open a bank account and not do all of these other things? Yeah. because it's not a balanced thing you know if, if you say great python you know here's a course here's some options for you but also on the flip side to that you need to start with these basic foundational skills of life of just practicality of you know um uh, finding your way around mm. that would be fine um so i think it it has to stem from early education uh, before uni, before that. I, I dare to say this too, as, as parents too, um, you know, like I, I was lucky, you know, that my mom and dad said, don't work when you're really young, we'll look after you, you know, you just concentrate on your education. So, but by the time I was 16, they're like, you know, it's, it's it, go get a job. And again, I'm 51. So this is a long time ago, early you know, mid eighties. And, um, and I got a job like doing flat roof uh, construction, like tearing off flat roofs in Saskatchewan in the summer. And it was really hard work, really hard work. But it gave me certain life skills about showing up and being at work at 630 yeah. in the morning, working until like six or seven o'clock that night because it's in the summer and you have to work while the sun is out. Um, and these kind of carried on into like put, put it grafting and putting in a good day's work. And then I've got a I've got a friend of mine who's he he is a consultant with some advertising agencies, and they had done a, a early hiring for a, a guy straight out of university. I think he was like 22, 23 years old, and he just wasn't up. He just couldn't show up for work. He was late. He mm -hmm. he wasn't working very hard. Um, he had this kind of entitled attitude, and they had to let him go. And literally the day like the day he let him go, he got a phone call from the guy's father, saying, "You can't fire my son." you know this isn't this isn't right you're not allowed to fire my son and the guy's like yes we are your son wasn't very good at the job he couldn't he couldn't show up it was late and and it's like this this child had been brought up into this kind of world of entitlement like you you know you're not allowed to get fired mm -hmm. so i think parents parents have got a lot to say too and a lot, a lot to stand up for don't they i i agree i agree um yeah a lot of it isn't even the kid's fault um, as you say, it's 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 what you get exposed to growing up. And um, I think many of of like, you know, many of the, the kids in that in that Gen Z bracket and below, they've just kind of come into this world of like, you know, you um, you get a, pet, a medal for participating. You know, you are entitled to this. You, you know, you should have this. You you can have whatever you want. Like. You know, there's been very, I've been very lucky, like I've grown up, there's been no sort of major wars that have impacted me. You know, I've been insanely lucky, like the society I've grown up in. Um, I've, I've not had to face many adversities, um, but life's just not like that, is it? Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. A, a big yeah. part of it is, is parenting as well and, and how much you give away and, yeah. and, you know, I don't you, think there's anything danger with dangerous with teaching your kids resiliency, but also how to be vulnerable and compassionate. I think that like you, we've used the word balance a few times, and I think that that's the something that you can instill in kids is to is to be tough and resilient, but also to be tender and kind, um, and 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 it is a, a balance. But I think we're all, we're constantly learning and we're constantly getting information on how to how to do these things. So enough about parenting, <laughs> but. Let's get into uh, now the corporate side of things. I'm really interested to know, you know, if you're a company 
um, that wants to bring on interns and they go down the route of going down to the grad stock and they click on I, I'm an employer and they go down that route. What uh, I've got two questions. What is the route that they 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 go around? But also um, a question about which industries do you find um, to be you know more receptive to interns and you know where have you seen interns really really flourish? So two part question and I'm conscious of time. No, no, <laughs> for you, for you, yeah, yeah. So I guess we just start with like, hey, this is what we do and this is how we do it. Um, just referring back to a, a point you made at the start about sort of me um, and how I run the business. Like I'm, I'm a bit of an organization freak. Um, mm -hmm. I live on, on to-do lists and, and efficiency and optimization and all that. And that's very much been kind of put into our internships as well. So um, the, the how we're able to run scaled internship cohorts for companies is because we have experienced every problem there is to, you know, during that process and, and understanding that deeply has enabled us to go, great, well, we can have this part automated, we need extra help here, we need these resources available at any one time, we need, you know, communication to be great, all the rest of it. Um, so the conversation always just starts with, you know, companies like, we get it, cool, we'd love to work with you, or kind of get it, can you explain this, this and this? And then it's really just simple. It's like, well, where do you need an extra pair of hands right now? Um, why would you want to run an internship? Is it to fulfill a temporary gap in your workload? Is it um, as a way of trying before you buy, if you're looking for a hire in the future? You know, let us understand why you're doing this in the first place. Um, and from there, we just take them down a path of, great, okay, so... Uh, these are your desired outcomes. Let's be transparent about that up front. These are, you know, the kind of the longer term things that you're potentially looking at, future hires or a longer contract. You know, all of our internships are two months long um, and they're just, they can be on a rolling contract. Um, again, just making it low commitment for a company, but providing that longer term, you know, package if they want it um, and just working backwards from that. And that just slots nicely into the structure that we have. You know, we then um, uh, put those roles out to our um, out to our sort of student network. You know, if, if a company says we need help creating extra content, great. You need a content creator. Um, uh, a lot of it's not rocket science or some companies will go, well, actually, we need a bit more of a broader kind of digital marketing um, person for a you know, couple of months. Great, perfect. Um, that means we can be broader in where we, you know, where we push that out. So students in our membership, they get it first. Um, uh, we have um, uh, subscription lists, you know, just via email. They get it second, and then we push out on our socials to open it up to everyone. Um, uh, and, and they get it, they get it last. We have a two week turnaround on search interview. Um, a company will then either choose whether they want to have the final interview or not. Um, that's always just personal preference. And yeah, we move pretty quickly. Then um, the students will get four weeks of training in whatever outcomes have been agreed with that company. So, you know, the company has said, great, well, we need, we'd love, you know, across that period to have 100 extra pieces of content created. Cool. Brilliant. That's a KPI. We can we can measure up to that. So we'll we'll aim some of that training before they start towards creating content well, efficiently to a good standard, the tools to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they can actually hit the ground running when they start, um, which is a, a big, big part of it. That was one of the biggest inefficiencies we found. You know, it take three or four weeks for a student to get onboarded with a company um, during that time they're not really doing anything they're they're learning so we we brought that ahead of time um, so yeah and then we are there to to support to to train to mentor um, your interns for you um, and you can have as much involvement with them as, as you want you know we recommend a kind of base of like have a catch up every week let them be proud of the work they're doing let them take you through what what, what they're what they're up to um, uh, but other than that, we'll assume that, you know, you want to be pretty hands off. And as I said at the start, we get some companies that are, are really great. They want to give more. They want to 
proactively support and, and train and give them more experience. And we also get companies who just need an extra pair of hands and aren't that bothered, which is which is fine. So the the second part is the is the industries. So I know you've come from a finance background, and you know I come from media and broadcasting. Uh, mm -hmm. But what uh, what other kind of industries have you seen kind of that that maybe have surprised you where interns have have moved into from university? I imagine medicine's a pretty hard one, but with regards to maybe law or finance or or media, um, what what kind of industries are, are like I say? Do you what are, what's the spectrum of industries, and then which ones have kind of surprised you and and show, you've shown some interest in? Yeah, the the I guess our kind of golden nugget client, if you like, and the ones that fit this really well are often startups and small companies across industry. Resources tight, money's tight. Um, they're the most receptive to nurturing young talent, um, and they're the most in need of the extra support. Um, companies, smaller companies that are like scaling as well. We work with quite a few of them. They're they're great. Um, they can offer you know quite a few internships, um, and again, it fits very nicely with that. Again, cross industry. Generally speaking, marketing is a very popular one. Mm -hmm. um, it fits very nicely because it's uh, it's not just a popular sort of industry for students being interested in, um, but it's probably one of the easier ones to, um, I guess, bring people into, um, which is great. Um, we spent quite a bit of time looking at law because it's so hard for lawyers to get into, into full-time uh, training contracts, which is a part of their, you know, uh, part of their way to becoming a, a fully qualified lawyer. But ultimately the industry is so rigid in its processes that it just, unless you're like a, like a legal startup. Um, so you're not, offering traditional legal services it's you know it's like regulation technology or or a legal fintech or or whatever or a software maybe a, a SaaS company that specializes in dealing with law firms there just isn't room for that kind of dynamic of short very flexible part-time remote internships um you know so those kind of industries they're very very hard to to kind of cater for um but yeah so it's almost exclusively startups small companies scale-ups um yeah across industry with marketing probably being the, the the leading favorite we're getting quite a lot of um uh quite a lot of fintechs because uh just of a, a small quirk that it costs a lot for fintechs to hire um which i hadn't i hadn't realized before um their their costs are naturally higher than other startups um so yeah that's been an interesting one that we've uncovered um yeah i think just yeah. startups in general really uh, my last question to you is going to be before i get to this one is going to be any really cool success stories that you want to talk about but so park that park that one remember that one but i want to get into just into our last couple of minutes because i know you've got to run off to a meeting but you are, you know, your ESG and your social responsibility um, are prominent on your site. You know, the, we talked about mission, but why is it important for you to be socially responsible, uh, environmentally responsible? And, uh, and you know, can, can you also weave into that, you know, the growth of remote working as well? Okay, so I've, actually, I've got quite a complex answer to this. Um, Go for it. There's, there's a TED talk that I watched a while ago. <laughs> I'd, I wish I, I wish I had written this down. Maybe I'll share it with you, and you can you can share with uh, with everyone afterwards. I can't remember the guy, but he talks about charity um, and the problems with charity. Um, basically, saying the whole thing's backwards. You put a glass ceiling on charities because they're non-profit making organisations, and he basically says charities should be profitable because the incentive there to grow and to serve more people through your charity is far greater than any other kind of tax breaks or, or you know, anything like that. Really, really interesting TED talk, flips the whole thing on its head. And I think a, a, 
likening that to solving real problems in terms of societal problems, like through our ESG stuff, you know, it's we're, we're mission led. We want to, we could easily just scale and provide internships to talented students who have great experience, who, you know, every company is like, oh my God, this is the best student ever. Like they're really overqualified. You know, they've got loads of experience. They're brilliant. It'd be easy. But instead, I wanted to use that kind of capitalism that, you know, we're, we want to grow, we want to be profit making and actually focus it on the students who need it, who don't have experience, who don't have uh, well connected parents, who don't have networks of their own, they don't have, you know, that work readiness side to them yet. Um, and, I, and I just figured if we can create a program specifically for them. Um, we still are incentivized by the natural incentives of business, um, and yet our outcomes are entirely pushed towards societal problems um, and creating more opportunity for the people who really need it, um, as opposed to just taking the easy path. Um, and yeah, it's it's harder, but you know who cares? We're you know we've we've got a model for it now. We we've learned. We've just it's taken a bit more effort in trying to figure out, okay, how do you take someone like that um, and mold them into someone where a company is going to be like, yeah, actually, we loved having that intern with us. Um, they were great. You, you support them well. They had all the answers. They pr produced a good output for us at the end. Brilliant. Um, so it just took a little bit longer time to, to, to come up with that structure that bit of extra hand holding required um, to, to achieve that. Beautiful. I feel like we could go more into this, but like I said, I know you've got to run across town to a meeting, but do you have, do you have a success story? Somebody, somebody who you fit into an internship that went off to, went on to, uh, to, to, to gain full employment and to, to grow within an organization that you want to share. I know that's kind of really like throwing you right on the spot, but. We, we, we have lots of really good success stories. Um, and that's not a cop out answer because I do have, have one in particular. I've really enjoyed working with. Um, uh, he's actually a friend of mine, and he started um, a dating app uh, while he was at uni. Um, a great brand, great company, great guys who run it as well. And we've just worked with them closely um, over the last like two years now, um, and it's been really nice to help them evolve and grow. Um, and I could really see what we were doing and trying to do, especially in the earlier days, um, not just evolving with them, but actually like providing real good value, seeing the end, the end outcomes of students, you know, being hired and then coming back to me going like this person that worked with us was just phenomenal. Like she has been responsible for, you know, we, we helped them expand into the US, for example. Wow. Um, and initially they were using agencies and those agencies just couldn't, they just weren't effective. And instead they ran, you know, they ran internships through us and used local internships as local knowledge and enthusiasm and hacky ways into different networks and markets and, you know, all the rest of that. And one outcome was, you know, this, this girl that they worked with one of, one of the interns that we, that we got and she was just incredible. She was brilliant. And they haven't stopped back on about her ever since they were like, she's just amazing. I can't believe yeah. it. Um, so it was nice. It was good. Um, and it was, it was a nice like different case study as well of us yeah. helping a company expand overseas, which is, which is quite cool. Good. Well, George, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And well, uh, let's, let's stay in touch. I know that there's, there's probably some work that we can do together in the future. So uh, really, really grateful uh, that we got to chat today. Thank you. How can people get in touch with you? Um, website, gradsock.com. Easy, loads of, buttons on there saying contact yep. us give us a call or just connect with me on linkedin george biddle b-i-d-d-l-e um uh, type in george the grad sock i'll probably come up my yep. my keyword search is pretty on point on linkedin so uh so yeah hopefully you can find me by that drop me drop me a message anytime beautiful thank you so much i think what you're doing is awesome and uh again thank you and, and you get off to that meeting and and thanks everybody at the elephant and castle for joining us today um, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nick. See you later.